Now, what I'm noticing is that um, uh, this is something that I used to do a lot when I was a little younger and I was very inf influenced by certain artists. This is looking a little bit like a uh, Jan Optbeek caricature. Maybe not so much uh, because it's the way I'm drawing, but it's possibly the way, uh, j just an exaggeration that he tends to favor. You know, the big mouth and the, the way the lines are drawn. He was someone I was hugely influenced by when I first started doing caricatures. Before I get back to that, you can see what I'm doing here is just throwing a layer on top of the drawing, a new layer in Photoshop. You can just click this little page tab over at the bottom of the layers, and I filled it with a peach color. It was a little dark, so I dropped the opacity. The opacity is up at the top of the um, layers menu on the right, you see there. And um, what I so that's on top of the drawing. Drop the opacity so you can see the drawing through a little bit. It looks like it's a darker version of that color. And I just got a skin tone that's just a base to start. It almost feels like it's a shortcut of doing a wash, of a light wash on a canvas or on a page or on an illustration board. And then from there, I put a new layer underneath the drawing. The drawing is in, uh, it, I, there's no need to really put it at multiply mode because I was drawing on a transparent layer before. So on that layer, underneath the drawing, I tone uh, just a gray tone because the color on top of the drawing will tone it to that hue, to that color. So it's just a putting a gray down underneath. If you, if I if I hid that layer, you would see it just be a grayscale drawing with some values, just like darkening it. And I'm just establishing the shadows. There's not a lot of variation, not a lot of contrast in his face in this photograph. There's a little bit. It's noticeable enough to, to use as reference for light source, but it's not very heavy. So I'm trying to establish that early on so I don't lose. So and now that we're up to speed on that, um, uh, Jan Optibeek, that's who I was mentioning. You can check out his work at Optibeek.com. O-P-D-E-B-E-E-C-K, Optibeek.com. Um, he has just, just tons of sketches, pencil sketches and finished drawings and digital paintings and traditional paintings. He's an amazing caricaturist in Belgium. Um, but he was a huge influence on me when I was starting out in caricature several years ago. And uh, he, he always has been an influence. He tends to exaggerate quite a bit. And one thing I've noticed is... Um, or one thing I learned from him, rather, is you can exaggerate everything about a face. You can exaggerate every fold of skin, every bit of cloth, every touch of hair. There is always a way to find a uniqueness to the norm or to the average, a way that something strays from the average. And I love, love that I learned that from him. So um, he was a big, uh, big part of uh, what I a big part of my life when I first started doing caricatures and I'm sure I stole a few things from him and some, uh, some practices and some habits and I definitely learned from him. I contacted him early on. He's just such a great guy. He actually recently released a book um, through the company that's carrying my book, Rejects, uh, Art Squared Publishing, and he, re he released the next version of Famous Corpses. This is an idea Jan had that I thought was just amazing, so I helped him edit the book, the next one. And uh, he's, it's, it's basically a celebrity epitaph roast. You've got to check it out. You just go to artsquaredbooks.com um, and uh, you'll see famous corpses in there. It's just incredible. They have a few great books and they're actually going to be putting out my next book. Um, so you'll see that right now I just decided to start painting on top. There's a new layer above the peach layer and... Um, from here, I treat it like a canvas that I've drawn on, I've toned, I've thrown in some values, some darks, and now I'm just going to paint on top. I'm not going to try to finish everything right here, but you can see I'm just grabbing some colors, I'm moving some colors around, picking some tones, and, and it's almost like I'm just mixing and experimenting on top. What's great about digital painting is the undo feature. <laughs> I love that. Um, I used to feel like this was cheating. I've mentioned this before. I was I was not very quick to warm up to the digital realm for artwork. I felt like if you weren't creating it with your hands, it wasn't real. And that, that barrier of a mouse or of a stylus or of a tablet or a Cintiq was, was just another way of cheating. And uh, I eventually learned to embrace it. And I think that that's very important nowadays. I think you can get things done faster. And with prices sometimes going down for illustration and design work, 
uh, you sort of have to adapt to the market and save yourself time and find a way to uh, make a little more money and get a few more jobs. So um, I really do enjoy the undo feature. So you can try things. You can be a little more bold. And in the end, I guess my point is you can try something. Put down a color. Put down a brush stroke. Just try something new or with it, try something with a piece color-wise or drawing a certain shape. And without the risk or the hesitation of feeling like you might screw it up, that it's so final. When you draw with a pen on paper, ink pen, it is final. It is so finished. And you can draw without pressure. By pressure, I mean uh, mental pressure, not physical pressure. You can draw without pressure and think, okay, well, I can always start over again. That's a great mindset to have, and I tell people that a lot. But in the end, it is permanent. When you draw digitally, you can get the look of pen, and it's not so permanent. You can just undo erase, control N opens a new file. It's so simple. You don't ever have to commit to anything until you're ready to get it right, until you have gotten it right, or you recognize that you figure something out. So in the end, I find that the experimentation of digital art has taught me things and has found uh, helped me find solutions to, uh, to problems that I, I think otherwise would be a little more difficult to solve. So I think it's a real, it's a real blessing in this time of technology. Um, now I'm just just trying to get a basic paint, uh, a, a basic uh, finish to his eyes. Ron Perlman's eyes are amazing. One strays off to the side and looks a little more lazy. It's his left eye on our right side right now. And the reference is a bit small in this video, I know, but you can see what I'm getting at in the painting. It's a little bigger. Uh, he's got this great heavy brow that sits down low on his eyes. And when he tries to lift his eyebrows, his right side lifts a little more and you get to see that eye, but his left eye is just kind of straying a little left and dropped under that eyebrow. So I'm trying to get that effect right now. But I don't want to commit too much to a finished painting of the eye because I want to move along the entire painting having an overall finish at the same level. You know, I, if, if I'm going to be, say, half finished, with an area, I want to be half finished with another area and half finished with the whole painting before I really move forward. So while I, I tend to have a bad habit of picking at one area or trying to finish the eyes before anything else, um, uh, I try to not finish it too much because I know I have to move on. I have to finish the nose. I have to finish the cheek. I have to finish the whole form, the whole mass, the whole head um, before I want to move on and put a final polish to it and get the final look. So you can see I'm just sort of blocking in tones. Now, I've had a lot of people request that I show the brushes and talk more about the technical side of Photoshop, how I'm painting. Um, one of the preset brushes that you might notice, um, if you click on the brushes tab, it's in Photoshop. There are three brushes about halfway down through the preset menu that comes loaded. And it's been the same since 6, 7, CS, CS2, CS3. And I'm assuming CS4 is the same now that it's out. Um, the preset brushes, there's one that kind of fades and tapers a little bit. There's actually three of them, sorry. Three of them that do that. And I choose between those three based on how you feel. They're very similar. And then you can play with the flow and opacity of those. So what I do is I choose one of those three because it already has sort of a feel of uh, uh, pressure sensitivity. You can put it on, the way I would liken it to a real material is to that of Prismacolor art sticks, which I used while working at a theme park for a while. It, you can you can put it down like a color pencil or a pastel where you pressure if there's less pressure less color goes down more pressure more color goes down now the one risk you run for someone who might be a little more advanced at this or playing around with a little you might notice this even if you're a beginner um, is that when you do this method of putting down low pressure instead of committing solid to a color like paint like one might use gouache or oils if you put light pressure down you might lose a little bit of the saturation of the color now that's important. I was uh, talking to Tom Richman, who does illustrations in Mad Magazine um, last year, and he was painting with solid colors on one of his uh, two-page spreads that he was doing at the time, one of his parodies. He, he was using all solid colors, and he was spending a lot of time picking his colors, and I told him, well, why don't you pick a darker color and just press less and use this brush? And I saw him do it. And the saturation and the, and the beautiful tones of his color were lost a little bit. It became a little grayed out. So it's something you run the risk of. Um, working in this